Our next guest, I first only knew virtually through his appearances on Tested.com, but I was fortunate enough to become his friend in person, and I miss seeing him at conventions. To present the science of Mouse Guard, please welcome my friend, Kishore Hari. I just want to say, I think that's the biggest applause I've gotten since going virtual with everything during this <laughs> COVID time. So I deeply appreciate it. Uh, thanks, David. How's it going so far? How is online con? I think it's good. Yeah. I think it's going well. Uh, you know, I think there's a myriad of technical things that could have gone wrong with all the different, you know, sc scheduling of guests and rearranging OBS windows and internet going down and, and all that kind of stuff and knock on some wood. I think everything's gone according to plan. All right. Well, we've horribly jinxed ourselves right? for the next hour, but I think uh, uh, I think we'll manage through it. I have to admit, when you first approached me about this idea, the first thought that went through my head is like, why would we apply science to this universe? Because like when I first read the books, and I'm, gosh, it might be like ten years yeah. ago that I first read. Um, uh 1152 and i was like wow this is like almost not the antithesis of science but it, my reaction was oh this is such a different universe where i i just completely fell in love with it and just suspended my notions of of uh applying science but you've asked for it so we're going to do I it have, um have. but but i am not just for the benefits of chat i am not going to neil tyson uh, David's work here. We're actually going to take seriously everything that he put into the universe and then take it way too seriously and apply some kind of science principles to it. Um, I have a, way too many slides, but we're going to uh, try to hustle through them. But feel free to like pop in questions about the universe in chat and we'll we'll go through it. Um, David, I want to talk to you about weapons. First. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you you have some history with smithery in your in your life is that right is there a, was your um dad involved in any sort of metal making no no like well, i well, feel like i've heard you talk about like acetylene in a way that yeah, i was like that's true. is there some kind of metal making in david's past my, that informed my dad's this? a jack of all trades um so mm -hmm. he had been a shop teacher at one point he was also an engineer and a draftsman um and uh, so I had access to what would be like a home woodworking shop and a little bit of metal working equipment, mostly just for the metal. It was like a bench grinder and oxyacetylene tanks. So I learned to weld when I was 13 and I was turning wood on a lathe when I was six. Um, but no, no. In fact, that was a rule. That was a shop rule of dad's that he had even brought from the high school. No weapons. You're not allowed to use these tools to make weapons. That's not... That's not the function of creation in this shop. So, so no, really, in some ways, the opposite. Got it. Okay. So, that, so you busted a myth in my head already. Um, but how much, how much did you actually go and model some of these weapons off medieval um, uh, weaponry? Because when I started doing research on this, I, w I was kind of expecting some like artistic license, and these actually look pretty darn close. To what the medieval weapons of that time were with a, with a few minor exceptions yeah i mean i do a I do a um a very relaxed version of research i'll do some google image searches obvious even in some of those it's obvious some of them are like well this is a fantasy sword this is silliness um you know this this is overly sculpted or overly big or overly whatever um, you would never make an axe black would they no, i'm <laughs> kidding <laughs> but then you find some that are uh also, obvious, like I'm not necessarily doing the research to know this, but I'll, you can tell from the photographs, oh, that's in a museum. That's from a real collection. Mm -hmm. um, or that's a fantasy. And I, for the most part, cherry pick visuals. I'm not so much a slave to the history, but what looks right. And so sometimes it's historically accurate. And it just happens to be historically accurate. And sometimes it's blending something that I think visually looks cool with how can I make that look more realistic? How can I make that look practical? So there's enough hints, uh, especially in fall and winter, uh, that point to steel being the nature of these weapons. Whether they were using like wrought iron or cast iron in some way, you see some like forges and kind of some smith-like 
um, uh, areas within the within the universe that indicate that there would be some steel. So I want to actually take us back in time to probably the most important weapon that we know of um, uh, that's been discovered in human history. Uh, this is a, a dagger that was uh, discovered in King Tut's tomb uh, in, I think it was 1920s by this archeologist Howard Carter. Uh, and the reason this dagger is so incredibly uh, important is uh, beyond the fact that, hey, it's King Tut's tomb. Of course it's important. And and uh, Howard actually only took 19 uh, objects out of that tomb, which is probably 19 too many, but, you know, enough with the editorializing there. Yeah. This dagger was important because, you know, King Tut... Uh, related to times like 500 BCE. So how, or, or actually farther than that, I believe, um, how did they have a, a weapon that looks like it was made from steel? Uh, and this was our first link in modern times that we um, first popularized, link, and probably the best preserved one because it was actually kept uh, with his body in, his, in the sarcophagus um, of a steel-based tool that was made um, from iron and the and they were able to tell by looking at the iron in this that this iron came from a meteorite it wasn't actually dug up out of the ground and for most of human history up until like sort of the medieval times the iron source that was used to make weapons was all came from meteorites uh, and so we just didn't have any examples of that and so this is actually uh, the iron source for all of these early weapons was came from meteorites which is just crazy because like how do you just stumble across like a meteorite and you're like you know what i'm gonna do from that i'm gonna make a right. dagger <laughs> um not my first thought but it was interesting um we should get into how this is how the process generally works so like the basics of a, of a forge is you take some sort of ore whether it's from the meteorite or or uh built from the ground that has some percentage iron in it uh, and you mix it with charcoal, which is really your carbon source. And you essentially heat it over a flame and pump as much oxygen you can through a bellows or some sort of a device to get it as hot as you can. Uh, and the idea of you getting it as hot as you can is the iron will start to uh, to melt and purify as uh, some of the uh, other impurities sort of burn off. And the carbon from the charcoal in a very small percentage with like this kind of of furnace probably be about like one percent of the carbon will actually snake in between those iron atoms uh and create essentially what is steel uh this is the way they made made something called wrought iron which is more uh commonly made in uh european times and in medieval ages um and uh so this is about i think the earliest we know that this occurred was about 1800 bce um, uh, people along the Black Seas called the uh, uh, Chalabies uh, actually used a furnace of this type to actually make a stronger metal than bronze that was commonly used at the time. Uh, and they used furnaces like this to mix charcoal with iron. We don't think we they knew why it worked. Okay. Like we, we're pretty sure like they didn't realize the charcoal was actually embedding carbon in the iron, but there is some indication that they knew that the heat um made the iron stronger in some way uh and, and i should back up and say steel is essentially purified iron uh that's mixed in with carbon at high temperatures and and uh, to make the sort of strengthened um uh alloy uh and the the difference between strengths of steel all depend on the temperature and the nature of the processing of that iron uh and the and the purity of it all right so this is what wrought iron actually looks like so china uh, in china we know from dating about 500 BC, uh, BCE, Chinese metal workers were essentially building these giant seven foot tall furnaces. Um, and uh, they would put sort of like, you know, wood at the bottom to, to fire these. These could get to higher temperatures and then they would take the liquid and cast it into a mold. Uh, and so this is the first, you know, essentially cast iron. And this method uh, produced in an iron that was stronger than the than oh, the really? wrought iron that we saw. I it's was... technically stronger, but it has it was slightly more brittle. That's what I was going to so, say. I was like, going to say I always think of cast iron as being brittle. Yeah. yeah. So it's not so much. It, it's unclear 
that if it would if cast iron would actually be better as a weapon we don't see many weapons in china from the time actually built from cast iron there's much more stuff this isn't a, this is actually a coin from that period of time uh but you know interestingly the one thing they don't make cast iron skillets like the thing that we associate <laughs> to cast iron is not the thing they actually um uh used it for they did use it to to make some uh statues at the time uh there's another group i mean there's actually groups in india doing this as well uh but the uh item on the left is a schematic that uh, somebody is uh, used to build a current version of a authentic japanese samurai sword forge um and they were probably the ones that that popularized a method that led to probably the best weapons of, of that time period in, in this medieval time period uh, that we're roughly talking about. And they use like a furnace that became much more popular, which the Chinese had invented years earlier, this idea of this huge furnace. And the idea of this blast furnace is that you could get it to much higher temperatures uh, because you were essentially having hot air come at the bottom um, of, of where the flame was. And you could get temperatures they probably weren't in these in these home forges getting temperatures out to 3000 degrees, but they're able to get into like a couple thousand degrees um, with this uh, with this forge. And in so doing, they're able to actually create a more pure iron that was able to be mixed with steel. Uh, so the Japanese at this sort of time, if we're comparing Europeans, Japanese, Chinese, Indians, were able to probably make the strongest steel in 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 terms of weapons and also because they're able to burn off more impurities than some of the other people a lighter steel uh than what uh most we saw so that was a, a quick rundown so by the way all of this totally possible and realistic based on the universe that you've created uh what about, so what about at the scale what about at the um that's something i always wondered about with with mouse guard is the scale of it that uh uh you know getting something that small that hot uh, being able to keep up a temperature for long enough. You know, when, when you're talking about a large flame, yes. When you're talking about something very small, uh, you know, I'm, I'm obviously taking liberties, but... Yeah, it's it's less so much, um, you know, the thing that I actually looked into that a little bit, it's less about the fuel source. Like, even if you break down wood and, it, and do it, you know, in a smaller twigs and stuff that would be appropriate to the size of mice... Uh, you can still generate the kind of flame you would need and the temperatures from the wood. The problem is the amount of airflow won't change in order to get the level of oxygen you need um, uh, to, to get the flame up to that temperature. So uh, they would have had to have had basically the same kind of size uh, inlet that we're using for hot air uh, as we use in, in human furnaces, so drop- which would have been the size of... Uh, a couple mice wide, let's yeah, just yeah. say. So, so dr- draw bellows bigger is what you're telling me. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure that would look good inside of <laughs> the universe, but I would say that that was the uh, the only sort of limitation. Okay. Um, by the way, uh, that process that of using a blast furnace that the Chinese invented in 500 BCE basically was how weapons were made up and through to the mid 1800s. This is an oil painting um, of a Bessemer furnace which is basically the only kind of real advance in technology. Like everyone kind of slightly made uh, tweaks to the blast furnace, but this is when it actually changed. Um, What they did was they used to like, when you used a blast furnace, what they would typically do is, is pour it over into like a mold or uh, into a, uh, into a trench. So what the Bessemer's process did was it blasted air through perforations in the bottom uh, as it was flowing through this area. And all of a sudden, after 10 minutes of continual blasting through the molten iron, which is not what anyone would do, they would basically have air coming in until everything would melt and then kind of stop, be like, oh, we have our molten thing. We can just like, you know, cast it or do whatever. Yeah. The best of process is like, let's keep going. Let's throw more air at this. Uh, and initially nothing would happen, but it, the reaction takes a, a few minutes, but after about 10, 15 minutes, when he first did this, um, it started making this sort of like crackling kind of um, noise uh, as it sort of oozed. And that's where the term pig iron comes from, by the way, um, okay. is the noise the iron was making. But uh, it started to burst with flame after about 10 minutes. Uh, and this was uh, this changed the amount of purification they were able to do on the iron coming out of the process. Okay. And from there, they were really able to get like almost a 
uh, percent pure iron and then apply the carbon back into it um, at a higher concentration, like two, three percent. So and that's when you start to see mar modern steel emerge. So it's just getting it hotter. It's not changing the viscosity of it or anything like that. It's just getting it hotter. It's get, like continually fueling oxygen through it for the uh, it's impurities. it's not so much hotter. It's about the oxidation that you're you're oh, okay. Um, okay. you're achieving. Um, they use some like different carbon bearing alloys. Like they use a, a special alloy that was a combination of iron and manganese to uh, to help kind of seed this and turn it into a really high quality steel. But this is this is the type of furnace they advanced that actually changed the entire nature of how steel was made at the time. Uh, by the way, let's actually look at what a real medieval sword from the 12th century looked like. Um, I gotta say, David, this looks kind of like your swords in close, your book. Close, close. I like. Uh, it's I like, pretty good. I like that there's some non-symmetry going on because mm -hmm. I don't always draw things symmetrical. I like that there are parts that maybe are a little bent because sometimes I draw parts that look bent. I like that. Yeah, and like the idea of like a oversized hilt and not like a, you know, I I've always remember the the mouse guard swords as the the ones that are a little more triangular. Than what I associate to to humans. That sort of that, um, that one sword of Liam's is weird. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and but this kind of evokes that to a certain extent. Um, so I, uh, I, I think it, the the license makes sense here. How much do you think a sword like this would weigh? Oh, I actually know uh, the answer. So okay, I'm I'm gonna say five pounds. Okay. Uh, this weighed uh, just under three pounds. Uh, the okay. swords from this era typically weighed around two and a half to three pounds, give or take. Japanese swords, I, as I mentioned, were a little bit lighter, um, but you know, and it obviously depended on how how you know broad the the sword was. Sure. Um, but generally I mean, five, speaking, five pounds. If you took a five pound weight and tried to swing it around, you'd be exhausted in minutes. So the fact that totally. this one is two is even better. <laughs> but I want you to think about the ratio. Like, let's say an average human weighs 150 pounds, or we should actually convert this to uh, to metric. Um, so let's say average human weighs uh, like 120 kilograms, and uh, three and a half pounds is uh, what? Like, uh, oh, you, wow. you're, you're should... on your own in the conversion. I'm out. <laughs> 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 uh, this is this is embarrassing. I, sh I should have done the metric conversion uh, ahead of time. So it's a one and a half kilos um, uh, to go. Um, oh shoot! I lost my presenter view. Here it's back. Um, one and a half kilograms uh, for the sword if you weigh about like 120, 130 kilograms. Um, so uh, just think about that ratio mm -hmm. of weight to weight. Okay, because now I'm going to ask a, explore a question that I think is important to me. So we know that the swords look about right, but could mice actually wield them? So well, I'm going to put aside the obvious problem that mice really can't stand on their hind legs and they cannot um, hold uh, tools. Uh, but you're, we're just going to accept that as part of the universe. Yep. That's just the, uh, the fact it is. So how strong are mice? Uh, there are a number of experiments that have done this. Um, and here we go. So the this is the protocol that scientific labs use to measure the strength of mice. Uh, the protocol involves um, uh, creating these um, these lattices and having the mice hang upside down from them and seeing how long they can stay on those lattices for an extended period of time. And in what may be the cutest thing you have ever seen, they create these chain links attached to steel wool and basically grab the mouse by the tail and have them grab the steel wool with just their two front legs um, to see how long they can hold the chains. And the chains are of differing uh, lengths and therefore differing weights. Um, and you know, you might see at the top of that article, you might notice a word above measuring the strength of mice. It says video article. So guess what, David? We are going to see it in action. Um, here we go. I'm going to play and I'm going to jump around uh, a little bit. Um, I, I don't think the sound is going to come through, but you can see them actually uh, uh, creating these linkages. And they had done them um, basically ranging from about five grams all the way up to about 270 grams in total. 
Uh, and we're about to, oh wait, 20 grams, sorry, to 85 grams in total. Uh, and then they did a 100 gram one, essentially, that wasn't pictured. Uh, and we're about to see the mice pick it up. Uh, so this is the mice grabbing like the piece of like steel wool and holding onto it and holding onto it as long as they can. Uh, and they found, and that I would say this laboratory mouse is is pretty comparable to the mice that we saw in in Mouse Guard. You sure. know, these aren't rats. Right. These are right. kind of like along the size of a wood mouse. They they would weigh somewhere between twenty and thirty grams. Uh, so these mice are light. So think about that. These mice are lifting. Um, and by the way, the average mouse of this weight range uh, that w weighed between twenty and thirty grams was able to lift for an extended period of time, 80 grams of weight. Wow. That would be if you could hold on to uh, essentially, like if you're a 150 pound person, 600 pounds of weight. Yeah. Wow. So these mice are strong. Uh, so let's apply this uh, forward a little bit. First of all, this is adorable, but <laughs> let's apply this forward. Um, so we have to take into account the relative proportion of humans to mice. Uh, to do this. So uh, an average male, I'm not going to take the North American male because we're a little hefty, um, but the average male in, in the world weighs about 62,000 grams. Uh, and the, the sword weight is about 1600 grams, I, as I said, about one and a half kilos. Um, the mouse, 30 grams. Um, and a sword, if we take into account their relative sizing, which is a difference of about uh, 2,500, would mean they would if we just scale down the sword, the sword would be like just under two thirds of a gram. Um, but we know that they can hold 80 grams. So I'm here to tell you, Dave, not only could they hold that sword, they could hurt somebody with it because they have enough force given their strength to really jab somebody with a sword wow. of, of that size. The only issue is, I mean, only, only with all <laughs> necessary caveats. Um, the big issue with it is that their limbs are exceedingly short compared to humans. Uh, so the distance they would be able to actually exert this force over is very narrow. So you'd almost have to like crawl inside the snake's mouth before you, you actually swing the sword and do damage to it. Uh, so I'm here to tell you, David Peterson got it right with how that snake was murdered. Spoiler alert. Issue one. I did it in the first one, then <laughs> ruined everything after that. Uh, we should talk about the Black Axe. Um, I, can I ask, uh, what what was the inspiration for the Black Axe? Why, it, like, was there something about like it being black, or was it modeled off after a specific axe? Uh, so I I had a character that um, I wanted him to be my Obi Wan Kenobi mouse. And I just thought uh, uh, it'd be cool if people didn't know who he was. So we ended up taking the name of something. And the Black Axe just sounded cool. The design of it was actually a, an art swipe um, from a cover of a Hellboy novel um, called... Uh, oh, now I'm blanking on what it's called. It's not The Bones of Giants. It was the one that came out before that. But uh, yeah, Hellboy, Hellboy is... Uh, surrounded by all these kind of zombie skeleton characters and there's one that has an axe that looks remarkably like that and because when i started designing these characters i didn't know that i was going to make a comic series i just totally swiped mignola's axe design that one of these zombies is holding uh before we go on i just want to shout out uh vern nyc who notes the latin name for a mouse as a uh, mouse muscularis or muscularis I, I never my latin is pretty bad so yeah the the name is is pretty well earned um, so I was wondering, like, we see very rarely in our depictions of medieval weaponry the idea of black uh, weapons, and certainly not black armor. Uh, so I went on a hunt to see how realistic this was, uh, and it took me to a surprising place. Uh, this is Henry VIII's armor. This is his actual armor, uh, and it's black uh, with this kind of brass exterior. And the reasoning behind it is um, is because it was more intimidating looking, um, according to him. And so this idea of, of contrast was there. Uh, and then I went down this weird historian slash science rabbit hole, and I found there are these uh, his medieval historians who had actually published a paper talking about how we have uh, essentially uh, shinied 
the history of steel at that time because iron and steel are easily colorized. And during that time period, they were often colorized. But our preservation techniques were often guided by the bias of what we thought armor should look like. So oftentimes when armor was extracted from uh, through historical means, they would shine it up. Yeah. Uh, and in so doing, probably remove either some paint or finish that had originally been there. And I love this. Uh, I love a couple quotes. I'm going to read you a quote from a, a couple medieval historians. Uh, quote, if, but if you flip through medieval paintings, you'll see that armor is frequently depicted in a variety of colors like black and russet. Sadly, much of the quote unquote white armor you see today was probably originally colored um, uh, and uh, uh, later stripped, leaving, you know, just like that happened in cathedrals. And the other quote is, I personally haven't read any evidence suggesting that this kind of visual uh, effect was associated with low status. Rather, I think our fixation on the ideal that armor had to be shining and white says most about how our modern one-track imaginations fall fail to grasp the full color potential of steel to the point of actually polishing it off in some cases to try to preserve a polished version of the Middle Ages that's less colorful than the actual Middle Ages were. And so... I want to, again, acknowledge David Peterson <laughs> for probably getting it right that uh, black armor was correct. I did it. That, but it, get, it, gets, it gets stranger. Okay. Uh, these are axes from the 12th century. They were found on a boat in Loch Corrib in, uh, in Ireland. Uh, so uh, don't know exactly you know, how they're used or why they're used. These axes were likely black in color. Um, and David... Do you happen to know what type of axes these are? Uh, it's a single beaked axe. That's all I would describe that as. Oh, these have a more specific name, sir. Okay. These are the Peterson Type M axes. No. I'm not kidding. Not kidding. Swear to God. What's, these what's Irish spelling axes, of Peterson? I, I could not find out the name, but I couldn't find out the lineage name. Okay. I ran out of time. I like I discovered this like last night at like 2 a.m. But it's Peterson Type M X, um, and there. That's got to be who, uh, dis who discovered it, though, right? The archaeologist. I would, I would bet in okay, some way okay. it's named after that. But like, I also couldn't find why it's Type M. Right. Like, I don't know what. Like, what does that mean? Like, I, I was. Let's pull so up the M more, section of the grid. I have more research to do, but I found this eminently uh, hilarious, and I was sort of secretly hoping there was a story. You're like, yes, I'm the from the Peterson X clan. <laughs> <laughs> going back a thousand uh, years i wish i wish i mean we got some pretty cool petersons in the family but uh no axe discoverers okay i i'm terrible at one thing which is pronunciation so you're gonna have to tell uh pronounce it for me yeah channel way kelena kelena i yep that was terrible that's okay that was really that i've heard, I, and I've like, heard there's Solana literally a pronunciation and... guide in the faq um uh so uh, we know, I think there was inferences, and I have to go back and look at the mm -hmm. exact language, but you, there's inferences that the black axe could have been forged in, in something that was higher temperature. There was like some, like, there's one line that I felt like was almost like a throwaway line that it was made with a special way. Uh, and so applying forward, like what we've learned about sort of like the history of smelting, I'm going to apply forward this idea that it was forged at higher temperatures okay. and therefore um it actually had a higher purity of iron in it um and was mixed with two to three percent carbon which would naturally give it this kind of black uh coloration um and so it wouldn't have been painted and the advantage that weapon would have had if it was forged at a slightly higher temperature a couple hundred degrees de definition of slightly depends there right uh but it would have been a stronger weapon so not only would it would have been cooler looking because it definitely was uh and and a different color it would have actually had an advantage in combat um so does the black the black oh, axe being a fabled weapon totally works does the black do anything uh in the metallurgy to protect it from oxidation uh no okay like not an oxidation in the way that uh, we think about it in terms of like the iron oxidizing and causing like rust yeah. uh, to form. 
Uh, not in that sense. It won't offer much of an advantage in the context of like historical preservation, like over the time scale that we're looking back on these weapons. Well, but even not I'm really. Ta- I'm talking about in during, that time. Yes, yes. During during that in, weapon's lo- useful lifetime with the wielder, a polished. Yes. I would think a polished weapon would be more vulnerable to becoming corroded, rusted, etc. Over time, as opposed to a, a blackened weapon. Well, I think the higher temperature also, if I read this correctly, right. like once you bake off some of the impurities, you get less pitting on the actual steel. Uh, so you, it would have made a like using that sort of medieval casting of the time, assuming it was cast, um, you would have had a potentially stronger weapon and less prone to breaking because of that. So like the oxidation would have been like an afterthought to like that sort of like um, almost like physical defect. Uh, that would have been uh, removed by having the, the the higher strength steel. All right. We have to talk about the actual mouse. This is a real thing. This is a statue of a mouse in uh, Novosibirsk, which is in southwestern Siberia. It's in front of the Institute of Cytology and Genetics. This monument was both there to celebrate the, institu- the contributions of mice to science, uh, which ranges from cancer research to aging to understanding like even microgravity in space uh, uh, to advanced science because mice are one of the most commonly used um, uh, animals in scientific research, especially in determining um, as a model for, for uh, mammals and uh, in particular humans. And I know there's no context of, of mice in space in Mouse Guard, but I said mice in space, so I'm going to talk about mice in space because it's cool. <laughs> so this is um, uh, this is an actual experiment that NASA has been running aboard the ISS. Uh, they've been looking at various functions of how mice behave in microgravity, uh, both uh, to understand uh, bone loss, skin tissue loss, muscle loss, um, the ability to adapt to microgravity, uh, this experiment's been running since 2014. Uh, the the picture in the upper left is actually the habitat they've created. Uh, and then you can see one of the astronauts next to the device aboard the ISS. Uh, and here's a paper that came out uh, just last year uh, on this. And they found, um, interestingly, just last year, they found uh, that in addition to muscle loss and bone loss, which we know is a common thing for astronauts that go uh, into space, they actually had skin loss, like mass of skin loss, um, and which is a new effect. Um, and we can take a quick look at what um, what it looks like to have mice in uh, microgravity because we can, and we have a video. So this is mice adapting to microgravity. Uh, and so what they found is uh, they weren't as quick to adapt as humans because A, they couldn't have been prepared. There was no training for it. Um, but they uh, they actually did quickly adapt, um, uh, and they started to uh, uh, this self grooming behavior that that is uh, showing up on the screen right now. That's totally a behavior uh, to calm the anxiety of being in a situation. Um, but they started to after uh, a, a couple days of being on board. Look at that ma- that mouse is like floating around in microgravity. This is the coolest thing ever. Um, uh, uh, they were actually able to adapt and started to exhibit sort of quote unquote normal behavior um, and started to use microgravity to get to their destination. So they would start floating like we'd see a lot of astronauts float. Um, so I, I find that just eminently uh, uh, hilarious. Uh, we should talk about aging because I think that's one of the most interesting uh, aspects and learnings that are um, that have come out of um uh, research on, on mice over the years. So human and mice don't look alike, but the species have um, a lot of actual biological similarities. And because of our development process is very similar from like embryo, the way that like stem cells differentiate within us to form like heart, brain, lungs, kidneys, etc. cetera. Um, and the systems that we have are similar in terms of like reproductive, digestive, hormonal, nervous systems. Um, they made them like exceptional uh, mammals to study. And when it comes to aging, one of the things that uh, we looked at uh, that, that has kind of been proposed and it come out of enormous research on mice over the years is, is really the fundamental question of, of why do we age? 
like what is causing us to kind of break down as we age and one of the theories that emerged was uh well i'll do i'll back up and say a long time ago it used to be this theory that like we'd have damage to our dna uh and that's that's why we'd age um or like some something was happening during cell division that would that would cause aging uh and the current best theory is something is based on something called dna methylation so you go through a constant process when cells divide and uh, chromosomes are made and they split and uh, of division and repair because nothing we do at the cellular level is done perfectly and so there's mechanisms to kind of self-correct when all that happens 99 percent of the time that goes really well it's actually above 99 percent. but there's these one percent um, of situations that leave sort of like uh, uh, targets, almost like chemical reminders of where the division hasn't gone perfectly. And that those kind of impede function over time. And that's like roughly what DNA methylation is. It's sort of the, the chemical signature of when that repair function doesn't go perfectly. And what has been found is that DNA methylation is actually well correlated uh, to the idea of aging. And that gave birth to this idea of an epigenetic clock, is that there is things that behaviors and activities that seem to increase DNA methylation, particularly in mice, and ones that didn't. So some of them, uh, in sort of a gross description, are like exercise seem to reduce DNA methylation over time. Uh, like a, uh, a certain type of diet would restrict it. Um, overeating, smoking, drinking seem to increase DNA methylation. And all of this idea that there that we have a clock that is well correlated to how long we live and our cells live and die um, has been established. It's called Horvath's clock and now generally referred to as an epigenetic clock. What is amazing about this is this is where the idea of intermittent fasting is now uh, emerged from, is this idea of restricting our caloric intake over specific times because it reduces um, the effect of DNA methylation at a cellular level. So the idea is that it can actually slow down the process of aging. Well, these researchers went further. It's like, well, if this DNA methylation is almost like an indicator of aging advancing, could we actually reverse it? Not just like stop it, actually turn it back. Uh, and they've been able to do that in a few experiments in mice. And I'm going to show you one um, where they actually, um, the mouse on the left that's sort of moving around quickly uh, has been given an enzyme called e, uh, ENAPT uh, that um, has essentially slowed the methylation process. Uh, and even though these two mice are the same quote unquote age, uh, the one that has the enzyme in it is moving around like a mouse like a mouse that's a year younger than the other one. Uh, and in, by all definitions and terms, that mouse that's moving around quicker, even though in terms of time was the same age as the other one, was biologically younger. So they were actually able to sort of quote unquote reverse aging. This isn't without consequences. This isn't coming to humans anytime soon, but it's this sort of fascinating set of experiments that try to underpin like how we age. And so, by the way, mice only live like two to four years at best. Uh, so this idea that you have a character that's like the old, like wizened, yeah. uh, you know, uh, character, like, how is that possible? Like, I'm telling you that maybe because we've seen it e here, um, there is some life, there's some intermittent fasting, which seems to be the lifestyle that the hermit um, w was be uh, behaving in. And we've seen uh, aging reverse in, in mice. So eminently possible again dave peterson you're you're up again <laughs> uh i'll take i'll take a, a tie or a loss on that one i i completely said it's not fair to fans or even storytelling to only have the characters live a couple of years and and treat seasons as as you know decades of someone's life i i decided to uh to just change the change the rules and make them fit more like humans so that we could all relate all right uh, I just have a couple more topics, but and we'll stop and take questions and, and kind of play around with this. Um, I want to talk about the the snake because this is sort of fascinating research because there is that whole tension in the in the first book uh, around the the battle uh, between Liam and the snake, and um, there is this one panel, and I'm probably reading into it too much, where they recognize the snake is there before they visually see it, and I was like, is that true? Um, it actually is. 
Um, so uh, the idea of like how the snake um, uh, preys upon the the, the mouse, uh, like we we've kind of understood that for a while. There's like a vision, there's scent, uh, especially through the the to the tongue that the snake is uh, is seeing. But can mice actually sense the snake? And the answer is yes, but not through the same olfactory uh, uh, system that we initially thought. So this sort of breakdown of the of the mouse's uh, um, kind of scent, uh, scent system here above, you'll see the olfactory mucosa. That's like their typical like um, uh, kind of sensory for for smells. But there's this uh, vomero nasal organ that's sort of you know below that, and they're able to find the exact proteins that actually signal certain behavior based off of that, that they could tell a predator was near. And one of the ones they, te they tested like all sorts of predators, like cat urine, you know, rat urine, uh, and they tested snakes. And they're able to see um, that the snake uh, scent, this kind of like general sort of um, uh, excretion that the snakes were having, the mice would cower as soon as they would smell it. And it was through this organ and they were able to identify the exact proteins that uh, led to this behavior. Uh, and the experiment is actually on the bottom, how they did it. And they actually would knock out this ability in certain mice, and they would not have that fear when that smell was around. So they know that this smell actually had a contributing factor. So that idea that the mouse, the mice could actually uh, sen sense the snake before it was actually there uh, is true. And it's so true that we actually know the proteins that actually drove that interaction. So next time you um, write a panel like that, you can scribble in the margins, like the protein name, if you would like. Um, <laughs> that might be too much information. It might be too much. Or do, do other, might be too much. Do, do we know that other mammals can, um, can have that same kind of uh, uh, olfactory style sensitivity to, to those warning signs? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but not through necessarily this mechanism. So okay. like... Uh, bloodhounds obviously have a extraordinary scent capability and are able to sense um, not necessarily predators, but people that they're they're searching after uh, prey for from with at incredibly low concentrations. But they're using sort of a typical olfactory system that we thought of. What's interesting about the mice is that they're using this organ that is pretty unique to mice amongst the mammal, okay. the most common mammals uh, that that we talk about. There's a lot of rodents that have this organ within them, but we don't. Um, all right, bees. Uh, bees, friends of the mice or not friends of the mice? Uh, it turns out that we're going to see something gross here. So this is a warning bunny. Uh, a warning bunny means something bad's going to happen in a couple slides. So uh, mice are quite the pest for bees because they usually uh, invade a number of hives um, for for the honey and the and the wax to feed, you can talk to any number of beekeepers, and they'll tell you how uh, how troublesome mice can be for a number of hives. But bees can fight back, um, and I am sorry for this. Uh, but here is uh, the torso of a mouse um, that has been killed by bees, and the reason I'm showing this, which I think is fascinating is you know they found this mice and they they strung stung it to death but bees are vegetarian um like i've always you know i've known that since i was a kid like they don't eat meat so why is this so hollowed out and what it turns out is they're able to kill this predator at the cost of a number of drones but what they did is the next set of drones came in and slowly like dismembered the mouse and took elements of its body and placed it outside the hive and then would come back and take another piece and put it out so they like instinctually like this bee like took apart the body and put it away from the hive to stop it from like being a disruptive factor that's very bizarre behavior yeah um uh, is it, is in it terms a, of like a colony uh, dealing with an invading host. Is that potentially because uh, the, the, the reek of a rotting thing is going to interfere with their other senses? Is it just to get rid of waste and something, you know, nasty that's, that could cause disease? Is it to lure? Are, are they putting it out there to, to keep other predators from coming and smelling the stinky mouse? Or, or a warning to the next mouse. Um, <laughs> this, this is what I, we do to we your kind. Know, I, I couldn't find the answer to that question. Okay. Uh, 
So, um, you know, it might exist out there, but I don't know it. Um, so your, your theory is as good as mine. But I, um, all of this is to point out that um, I think this was probably the most unrealistic thing I saw, you know, besides like mice talking right. to each other. But I mean, like, um, I don't think bees and mice would get along. Yeah. I like the idea of it. Yeah. I treated them more like, like keepers that, uh, you know, cause the mice, right. the mice in nature aren't good keepers. They go in there and they're disrupting things. They're stealing. Whereas mm -hmm. the mice in mouse guard act more like human beekeepers that work around. So, so maybe, maybe the bees will be more forgiving if, if mice were more polite. Okay. Uh, and then one last thing and, uh, with, with spruce tuck, which, you know, doesn't get talked about, a ton in, in the book um i was curious like did we ever get uh, I, w I looked pretty carefully and i didn't feel like this was true um you know we never got w what abigail used as the poison it was just generic poison right oh no abigail used uh, uh hemlock oh it was hemlock that's right sorry um and i guess what i we don't know what I the medicine find... was <laughs> yeah that that's what i'm getting and do we think the hemlock came from spruce tuck? Because like the whole idea of that village is they use like science and potions and all sorts of stuff like that. No, no, I believe the hemlock was was sourced somewhere local to the Lock Haven area uh, by, the, by okay. the healer. And so yeah, she, I created my own universe and she's, story around. Uh, this. So that yeah, the healer who was who was supposedly healing Rand Abigail uh, was supposedly applying medicines and bandages and trying to heal him from his wound from the war when secretly she was making sure that it stayed uh toxic and open with small amounts of uh hemlock uh so this got me curious about rat poison just out of curiosity so <laughs> another just like random morbid thing uh and so this this is the least offensive image of rat poison that i could find so it, it has nothing to do with what i'm gonna talk about but but the most common rat poison right now is something called uh, bromodialone, uh, which is, it's this really interesting compound because it works by, it's an anticoagulant. And the way it works is it prevents vitamin K in mammals um, from helping clot blood. Uh, so what happens is it's just a small amount that's ingested, you know, relative to your weight. So like humans can actually have more of this before they reach a lethal dose. But um, in mice, a small amount, days and days later, slowly the the mice loses the ability to clot and they will have internal bleeding and they die much more morbid than i thought um but essentially like as the the body's stores of vitamin k get depleted uh the animal uh, essentially uh dies over that that period but this like slow acting poison was so reminiscent of what abigail was doing inside the story that it sent me down this rabbit hole of um of learning about rat poison it is not made, the, this is the other thing I was gonna point out is rat poison probably couldn't have been manufactured in medieval times. Um, it has a base of, of uh, something called uh, ethylchloral acetate, which is, um, it's a primary compound in a lot of uh, pesticides, but it's made, um, uh, it, it's made through modern processes. So there was no way to, to essentially uh, get it to uh, get it into medieval times, but I tried to make rat poison be a part of the mouse guard universe and just couldn't make it work. I'm sorry. That's okay. Probably for the best. Probably for the best. Uh, I'm going to stop there because we've been going for a while. We should probably see if there are any questions. Yeah, if there are any questions, uh, uh, ask in the chat. Um, I know some people were posting further links about uh, Jan Peterson, although I assume it's Yan Peterson. Uh, oh, is that who, a, who the actual yeah, Peterson type there was is? A, there was a a person ways back is uh, Jan, like J-A-N Peterson. I have to scroll back far enough. Uh, in 1919, who created a oh, dissertation. Peterson's typology of, of Viking swords? There you go. Wow. That was oh, sort this of, is that, incredible. That, that was written by, uh, that we were pointed in that direction by Vern NYC. Um, had a couple more comments about bluing and blacking of metals. Um, oh, yeah. I didn't get into bluing, uh, which is totally um, fascinating. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't think like it, bluing wouldn't have made sense inside the mouse guard universe. That's not something that was done in, in during medieval times. I don't think the sense thing that I was asking about other mammals being able to, uh, to know specific sense or get kind of a biological reaction of fear from a scent, um, comes from part of the reason that the mice are able to survive is that they have 
mapped out their territories by by pouring a mixture uh, a fluid on the scent border that is basically like a urine line how uh, an animal would mark mm-hmm. its territory except that it's something that they brew and i've left it vague as to what it actually is but i assume that they when they find um uh carcasses and things like that they will take they will they will sample bodily fluids from it um and and collect like urine and other glands and boil that down and it's a mixture of lots of animals so that whether it's a fox approaching that line or a bear or a weasel or a whatever they catch something that inspires them to go "Ooh, i shouldn't go in there that's something bigger's territory yeah it, it, that totally makes sense to me i didn't end up going deep into the weasel family i should have um uh, and there's so much about bats that I sort of left on the table. I guess that'll be part two. Uh, <laughs> I did. I, I will tell you, I looked very deeply to see if there was any mice crab interactions that I could uh, locate. Um, and not really. Yeah. There's some people doing bad things, trying to get crabs and mice to fight, but those are bad people. Yeah. Yeah. For the most part, I, I think even um, crabs aren't interested in you know it's it's easy easy prey when it comes to food they're not going after something that's going to be hard to catch so i think if there was a a a rotting dead mouse on the beach they would they would possibly consume it but they're not they're not going after the the mice Brittany mckinnis says very interesting presentation what do you think uh would have to change about mouse anatomy tongue vocal cords etc to make them capable of speech Oh, that is a good question. Um, God, there's so much because, like, there's obviously like what what we think of in terms of vocal box, um, but also like cavities in their head to create the kind of resonance to actually project sound. All of that isn't um, uh, possible inside of a mouse anatomy. So they'd have to just physically have a bigger head with empty space in it to kind of create the resonant space for that. I mean, the chief problem is that they don't have enough of a a frontal cortex to actually develop that kind of um, speech. Uh, So like everything would have to get bigger, um, but the development of of cavity empty space in their brain would I think be the most interesting kind of port empty space in the skull would be kind of one of the more interesting aspects of that. There we go. That is a weird answer to that question though, I will admit. That's a good answer. Yeah, I'm gonna that's interesting. I'm gonna uh, should I stop sharing? I want to get this rat poison off. Don't, my don't, don't actually. It'll it'll mess up the okay. display that I have right now if you start closing things. Okay, but you know maybe I'll go back. <laughs> yeah, to the go back first to a different slide. slide. Sure. All right, there we, there we go. go. Look, there we go. Awesome. This is awesome. Was this what you expected? Yeah, yeah. This is exactly what I expected. Um, maybe not all the topics are exactly the same ones that I, I figured you'd go to, but this is exactly the kind of thing. I mean, I have seen, I have seen your science of movies. And so I know exactly the kind of, uh, rabbit holes you go down, um, where sometimes it has to do with a specific plot and other times it's a, it's a drastic leap of like, this is an interesting thing that led me to this other topic. So I, I knew what I was getting into, and I'm glad for it. <laughs> uh, well, this has been awesome. I well, thank I you. have to run and take care of family stuff. Thank but you, Kishore. Online con. This was amazing. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome, Kishore. How how uh, how can people find you? What's what's uh, what's the way that people should be following you if they're interested in what you said here and want to get more? Uh, if you're interested in my nonsense, you can follow me on the Twitters. I'm at Science Quiche. Uh, and I typically do a stream on Wednesday nights on Twitch called Big Screen Science, where me and my friend Jeff Silverman break down the science in some of our favorite movies. Uh, we we do a watch long, and then afterwards we do a 20-minute breakdown, usually a little tongue-in-cheek, uh, about the science of the movies. Um, you can see me on uh, This Is Only a Test, which is a, a podcast on Tested.com. Uh, and uh, I'll probably be watching hockey later because that's what I spend most of my time doing. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Kishore.